Hello again. Welcome to part two of our answer to Jews for Judaism. Um, now you're going to have to forgive some of the video recording. I'm still getting used to new software that I have and the new camera and it's a little bit uh, sketchy in some places and the sound is out of sync a little bit but um, regardless I'll still just publish that and so here we go now what the church did was to strike a very strong blow for the credibility of their scriptures by simply gluing it on to the back of a Jewish Bible. That was a master stroke. Rather than having a separate Bible, we have the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh, and then they would have their own New Testament and have it as a separate book. What they did was to put it into one big book. They glued their scriptures onto the back of our scriptures and they called it the Bible. The word Bible means book. Jesus was a Jew. He lived his whole life as a Jew. He taught around Jerusalem and Galilee. Um, he was a, a Torah observant Jew his whole life. All of his disciples were Torah observant Jews. Now, they, uh, Jesus had differences in opinion of how to observe the Torah uh, than the leaders at that time, than the Sanhedrin. And therefore, they clashed. And when Jesus entered into the city, the triumphal entry, that's when they decided they had to get rid of him because of, they were afraid for political reasons. Now, um, when, uh, when Jesus was crucified and resurrected, the disciples were left to carry on the ministry to the synagogue every Sabbath and taught about the gospel of Jesus. Eventually they became such a threat to the synagogue that the uh, leaders expelled them from the synagogues. And um, from what I understand, many synagogues were converted to Christianity before that happened. And um, when the uh, Jewish leadership um, went after them, then the gospel, through the providence of God, went out also to the Gentiles, as was prophesied by the Hebrew prophets. Now, um, when it went out to the Gentiles, the Christians for 200 years were were, were hunted by Rome and by Jews. By Jews because they refused to observe the Torah according to the Sanhedrin, and by the Romans because they refused to recognize Caesar as a living God. So it wasn't until 325 that Rome adopted Christianity because it became politically popular. Um, now Rome, um, as a government, began to regulate Christianity. And they began to bring the bishops together to come up with what books were authentic, what books were not, what teachings are universally held, these kinds of things. It wasn't until 400 A.D. that the New Testament canon was even recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, now that canon had been identified earlier by, um, I can't remember exactly who it was, an Egyptian bishop, 
um, or but that is how the New Testament canon even came together. Now when you bring the New Testament together and you start learning the New Testament, it becomes very obvious that Jesus and the disciples are teaching the Tanakh. So obviously the Christian bishops got their hands on the Tanakh also, or whatever they could at the time. Um, probably the subtiguant, and they, you, they, they, that became a collection of their books. You see, the, the book wasn't even invented yet, really. Roman, I think the Romans had a book called a Codex. So they were beginning to assemble the Bible. It wasn't even a Bible yet. It was the, the Jews had a scroll. It wasn't even a book. It was a scroll or a collection of scrolls. And it was the same with the Christian bishops. Now eventually the, uh, the uh, Christians had to recognize a canon of the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Christian scriptures. And they, I think they adopted for uh, many centuries, they, they, they adopted the Septuagint, which is the Tanakh, but it has some extra books known as the Apocrypha. Now, um, that, what, that Apocrypha was removed about 1500 or 1600 by the Protestants. And uh, there was a, uh, battles over that also. But um, that's the history of how the Bible came to be. It, it took 1,500 years to come up with one uh, authoritative English Bible. So as this idea of a conspiracy of attaching a book to the back of the Tanakh and trying to sell it to everybody is ridiculous. This, this, is a, this, this developed over history, and you cannot learn the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles without learning the Tanakh. So that's why the, the, the Tanakh was added into the Christian canon. Now everybody has a canon. Um, the Jews have a canon, which is the Tanakh. The Christians have a canon, which is the Tanakh plus the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles, because they teach the Tanakh. I have a Mormon Bible in my study. It's even thicker than this. And what did the Mormons do? Brilliant! The Mormons took a Christian Bible, the Christian Bible which contains the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what did the Mormons do? They glued onto the back of the Christian Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, the Mormon Scriptures. And they have what they refer to as a triple Bible. That's what they call it, a triple Bible. It's really big, by the way. I have no idea how I lost it tonight. But I hope no one finds it with my name in it. That's going to be embarrassing. So. <clears throat> The Christian tactic of basically just gluing their Bible onto the back of a Jewish Bible, that can repeat itself. You know, when you throw a stone, you try and skip a stone on the water, it can bounce more than once. It usually does if you did it well. And so when the Christians try this to us, Mormons did it to them. And I wouldn't be surprised in another 500 years, some other new religion comes up, and they come up with a 24-inch wide Bible one day. As the um, disciples were going about uh, among the Jews, teaching the gospel of Jesus, you will see times where they search the scriptures to see if these things were so. And uh, Jesus also talked a lot about searching the scriptures. And whenever the New Testament talks about the scriptures, they're talking about the Tanakh. Now, 
when the early Christians who were Jews were looking at the scriptures and saying, yes, I do believe that this is so. There is something to this. And that's how Christianity became born. Now, when another revelation comes along, like the Book of Mormon and others, um, we do search the scriptures to see if these things are so. Search first the Tanakh. That's number one, because that's what that God says that you will know I am God because I tell the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And so whenever we have any other, I've read the Book of Mormon, I've read the Quran, I've read a lot of things like that that claim to be a new revelation. Now, you, you, uh, you have to compare what the Hebrew prophets said with what the Christian apostles said and what their teaching of the Hebrew prophets is. And then if any new teaching comes along, it must line up with that perfectly. If it doesn't, there's a problem, and the Book of Mormon is a big problem. There's a, it, it doesn't line up because the people who wrote it do not understand the Gospel or the Hebrew Scriptures. So it becomes very obvious when you start looking at it. It's a redefinition of the, the Tanakh. It's, it's ridiculous. So um, that is what that is about. So, you know, the, uh, the reason that we follow the Christian scriptures, it is not a redefinition of the Tanakh. It's a redefinition of how the Sanhedrin view the Tanakh, or how the rabbis view the Tanakh. And if you start to look at it, and see what Jesus and the Apostles are teaching, you start to see in the Tanakh what they are talking about. And you start to see how the ones who refuse the Christian teachings just don't see it. And there's a reason for that. And that was also prophesied. Uh, we can talk about that later. But um, it's basically, if it did line up, and if it did uh, reveal itself as a new revelation, and it did line up with the Law and the Prophets, then it would be acceptable, but I don't know what else there is to say that hasn't been already said. And also, uh, the apostles and Jesus warned of false teachers coming. Probably because of that, because a new revelation being added to the Tanakh does open that door, and we have to be guardians of watch, watching that door, of things coming in that should not be coming in. It is our responsibility as believers that we don't relegate that to some other person. We have to research ourselves what we believe. So we're going to begin with the beginning of Judaism. We'll begin with Moses, because Judaism begins with the revelation at Mount Sinai. So the question is, how do we know that Moses is a true prophet? How do we know that Moses really heard from God? So. What's important to understand is what didn't happen. What didn't happen was that Moses comes down from the top of the mountain and says, guess what? The Lord spoke unto me, and this is what he told me. That's not what happened. Because if that's what happened, then how would we know? How do we know that Moses actually heard from God? So this question is, from a Jewish point of view, the most basic foundation. 
And the Torah says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 9, God said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, and the people will hear as I speak to you. And they will then believe in you forever. So why is it that we as a Jewish people believe that Moses actually heard from God? The reason is because all of us heard the same thing. Every person who stood at Mount Sinai heard God speak to Moses. Now, for the Jewish people who stood at Mount Sinai to actually hear the voice of God speaking to Moses, it was too much. They told Moses after the second of the Ten Commandments, Moses, we're going to die from this. It's too much. You just do it by yourself. You'll tell us what God told you. But the first two of the Ten Commandments, everybody heard. So then when Moses says to them, you know, like God told me stuff, they believed Moses. So that's critical to understand, that the prophecy of Moses is, for us as Jewish people, rock solid. There's no question about the fact that he was a real prophet. It's because every Jew heard God speak to Moses. It's not just they were taking Moses' word for it. Okay, so Rabbi Skolbeck was standing in Mount Sinai at the bottom of the mountain with Moses, and he heard God speak to Moses and him. And he told Moses, uh, this is too scary. Uh, you go up there and talk to God for me. And that's how Rabbi Skolbeck knows that the prophets are true. Um, that is not how we know. That is how they knew at that time. And that is how the nation of Israel knew. And that is why they were judged more harshly for leaving the commandments and leaving God's uh, guidance when they did, because they saw it with their own eyes. Um, now, how do we know today that the prophets are true? Because uh, when we study history and we study the prophets and we see the timeline of how people came to be and we see the timeline of history going along with it, we can see God's hand in that. And the more you look at it, the more obvious it becomes that it is true. And uh, for me, I, I've studied it for a long time, and I don't just believe it's true. I know it's true. Because, but most people, the, the average person doesn't study that much. Um, the average person knows that the, 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 that the God they believe in is true when things, uh, serendipitous things happen for them. Their prayers are answered. God has a way of, of working in your life and revealing himself through actions in your life. Um, Jesus explained it like it's like the wind. The wind blows. You can see the trees moving. You, you can't see the wind, but you can see the trees moving. You can see the actions that are being um, operated by the wind. And that's how you know there is a wind. So it's the same with God. As you see the things around you, working around you, um, together, in, in some kind of an order that is directed by God and it becomes obvious to you when you become a follower of God. Now for a Bible studier like me, um, the history and the prophecy only adds to that. So that's how we know. Um, now through history, I guess, you know, people according to what revelation they had at the time were judged according to that. You see, if, if uh, 
if God comes directly to you and directs you, then you have a higher responsibility than someone who just believes without having that experience. So this is how we know. Um, for me, as I, I, am a, I am a witness to God. That, so that I testify what I have seen to other people. So in my testimony, I would say that, yes, I have uh, studied it very much. I have experienced it, and I know it to be true. Uh, it doesn't mean I can make anybody believe it, but um, all I can do is give my testimony and my witness to what I have experienced. So um, I don't know what Rabbi Skoback is talking about, that, you know, something that happened to Moses thousands of years ago, um, that is part of it because we see the effects in history from that event, which is, which is uh, documentable and documented. But for us today, personally, how do we know? Um, now, Rabbi seems to have this idea that he knows, and you should just listen to him. Now that's, um, we should all know. We, we don't just, I don't listen to the Pope. The reason I don't listen to the Pope is because he worships idols. Now, he doesn't say he does, but he, I, when I look at it, I know he does. So, I... Um, and the teachings don't line up with the Tanakh. So that's how I know. Um, that's a good example of, you know, if we're supposed to follow this one person who's supposed to know everything, then why not follow the Pope? That, that's a good question. Like, why should we follow Rabbi Skobek? unless we can see that what he is teaching is also true according to the prophets. But the $64,000 question is, but what about all the other prophets? What about Samuel? What about Amos? What about Nahum? What about Isaiah? What about Jeremiah? What about Ezekiel? What about Jonah? What about all the prophets we had? How do we know that they're real prophets? How do we know? How do I know that God spoke to Jeremiah? I mean, the prophets would say, Thus says the Lord. That's what the prophet would say. Thus says the Lord. But we have a right to say, How do I know? How do I know that God spoke to you? And that's an important question. It's a legitimate question. So what is the mechanism that God gave us? Now listen very carefully. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, the third passage here, this is God speaking through Moses. God says, if a matter is difficult for you, it's hidden from you, if there's some issue which you don't quite have clarity on, whether it's a case involving capital punishment or litigation, a civil situation, civil uh, law, or leprous marks, that's ritual law, whether to someone, is someone really a leper or not a leper. The Torah here is giving you three main categories of law. Capital law, civil law, ritual law. So the Torah is saying, what happens if it's not clear? What happens if you don't know what to do? Matters of dispute in your cities. There is a dispute, we're not clear about what to do. Then you shall rise up and go to the place that Hashem your God shall choose. You shall come to the priest, the Levites, and to the judge that exists at that time. And you will inquire, and they will tell you their legal decision. You shall do according to the word that they will tell you from the place that Hashem will choose and you shall be careful to do according to everything 
that they shall teach you, according to the teaching that they shall teach you, and according to the judgment that they will tell you, do not stray to the right or to the left. So let's think about this for a minute. What God is saying is, if you don't know if someone's a true prophet or not, and you don't know if there's a false prophet, who makes the decision, who makes the determination? The leading sages of any generation. The leading sages of that generation. Now wait a second. We're all grown up here. They're human beings, these judges. They're fallible. Are they perfect? Could they make a mistake? Theoretically. But we see something important. God certainly knows that these people are fallible human beings. If you suspect, if you suspect that, wait, they're just human beings, they may be wrong, God certainly knows that. But what do we see here? We see that God chose not to take another approach. What could God have said in Deuteronomy 17 if you get stuck in the future? I'm giving you all these laws through Moses. And God says, look, I know something might be confusing in the future. You may not understand. So look, if that happens, God could have said, just pray to me, and I'll come down again, and I'll reveal the answer to you like I spoke to Moses in front of the whole nation, and I'll make it very clear, goof-proof, no problems. God could have said that, but God obviously didn't say that. It's talking about the leading sages of each generation. Now, how do you know who the leading sages are? If you wanted to determine today who is the top pianist in the world, if you wanted to know who is the top pianist in the world today, how would you figure it out? Probably what you would do is you go to the top conservatories in the world, you go to the top piano teachers, you go to the top concert pianists, you go to the leading pianists in the world, let's say you go to a thousand of them, and you ask these, la these leading pianists, tell me, who are the top pianists in the world today? And probably when you ask all these teachers and, and great maestros, probably what will happen is the same three, four, five names will keep on coming up. So when people who are deeply involved in any subject, if you want to find out who's the greatest chef in the world, don't ask me. Ask people who are chefs. And probably again, the same four, five, six, whatever names will come up, these are acknowledged. Not because they say so. It's because the people who are the experts in their field, they acknowledge them as being the greatest experts. So what God is saying is that we go to the leading sages of the generation. They will make the decision. Okay, this idea, this idea of following the leading minds of the world is a very dangerous idea. Uh, who are we going to follow? You're going to follow the Pope? You want to follow the Orthodox Church? How about the Imams? You want to follow the Imams? Um, how to, how, there are so many leading minds of the world. Um, and these, all of these minds are teaching the Tanakh. They're, they're teaching of it. Um, and including the rabbis. So how do you know? How do we know? Um, what do we got from the leading minds of the world? We got climate change, carbon tax. Uh, it's just a power grab. It's, it's crazy. We got, uh, um, the jab from China. Well, that's that's the leading minds of the world. You know, it, it's just a, a descending order. It's it, something the the Western democracies have been founded upon defense from the leading minds of the world. Um, that we elect them every four years. And if they become intolerable to us, we get rid of them. Because they tend to 
those positions of power tend to attract psychopaths and uh, sociopaths, and we must keep them in check. It's, it's very simple. Now, I'm not talking about rabbis, but I'm talking about um, that system of selecting a leader is uh, very dangerous. Now, um, including the rabbis, you know, is he talking about the Sanhedrin? This is why they killed Jesus, because they're, they were the leading minds and they know better than him. Um, he stood up to them because they were um, working with the Romans and they were more interested in their politics um, than they were in God. And it's not the first time that that has happened. It's happened uh, for every prophet has had to deal with that kind of situation. Um, they had a lot of opposition from the uh, kings and um, the, the priests often had a lot of opposition from kings. So, um, you know, there has to be a better system than that. Now, I wanted to, uh, as a demonstration of prophecy, to take a look at Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, where God talks about the leaders. Um, starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, O mortal prophesy. O mortal? That's disappointing. That's very disappointing. That's a very dogmatic translation right there. Um, the word that they're translating from the Hebrew is Ben Adam, son of Adam, or son of man. Um, o mortal? It's, it doesn't say mortal. Um, there's another word for mortal versus immortal. Um, the the uh, an accurate translation would be son of man. And the reason I call it dogmatic is because uh, Jesus referred to himself in the four Gospels 77 times he referred to himself as the son of man. And um, this was, uh, he was linking himself to some prophecies, uh, particularly Ezekiel and um, also uh, Enoch. Uh, the book of Enoch has been rejected by uh, <clears throat> the Jewish leadership and also the um, Christian leadership in, in, the or in the Orthodox and Catholic Church. Um, but uh, the apostles did teach from the book of Enoch. They did uh, reference it. So <clears throat> that, that uh, term son of man is very prevalent in that book also. So it is uh, kind of unfair to say, uh, to get rid of that term son of man uh, because it links to other prophetic utterances. Uh, but it's up to you how you translate your Bible. But uh, I think the bragging rights have been knocked down a little bit over that. Okay, let's continue. O mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, To the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, you shepherds of Israel, who have been tending yourselves, is it not the flock that the shepherds ought to tend? You partake of the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not tend the flock. You have not sustained the weak, healed the sick, or bandaged the injured. You have not brought back the strayed, or looked for the lost, but you have driven them with harsh rigor, and they have been scattered for want of anyone to tend them. Scattered, they be, have become prey for every wild beast, 
my sheep stray through all the mountains and over every lofty hill. My flock is scattered all over the face of the earth with none to take thought of them and none to seek them. Hear then, O shepherds. Now remember, Ezekiel was prophesying uh, also just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, the first destruction. So this is before the second temple. He's prophesying this. Um, as I live, declares the, starting in verse 8, as I live, declares the Lord God, because my flock has been a spoil, my flock has been prey for all the wild beasts, for want of anyone to tend them, since my shepherds have not taken thought of my flock, for the shepherds tendered themselves instead of tending the flock. Hear indeed, O shepherds, the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I am going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. So this is a very powerful statement, God saying, I will dismiss the shepherds from tending my flock. Uh, this is leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. So, in order to reassert this claim of being the shepherds, you would have to look at the prophecies after the return of the uh, uh, captives from Babylon and see what they say about the tending of the flock and who is in charge. Okay. Um, the shepherds shall not tend themselves any more, for I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and it shall not be their prey. For thus says the Lord God, Here am I, I am going to take thought for my flock, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when some animals in his flock have gotten separated, so I will seek out my flock. I will rescue them from all the places to which they were scattered on a day of cloud and gloom. I will take them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and in the settled portions of the land. I will feed them in good grazing land and the lofty hills of Israel shall be their pasture. There on the hills of Israel they shall lie down in good pasture and shall feed on rich grazing land. I myself will graze my flock, and I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will look for the lost. I will bring back the strayed, and I will bandage the injured, and I will sustain the weak and the fat and the healthy ones I will destroy. I will tend them rightly. And then he uh, carries on, he says, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord, I'm going to judge between one animal and another. And then he talks about judging between a sheep and a sheep. And then, in verse 23, Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them and tend them my servant David. He shall tend them, and he shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will shall be ruler among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So uh, where does the uh, Levitical priesthood and the judges come into all this? When they were the shepherds that God took his flock away from, that took them out from tending the flock, and God tended the flock himself until he set his servant David over them. So how does that work? Um, you know, picking the leading minds of the world, 
has never really gotten us in very good places. Uh, the leading minds of the world tend to uh, feed themselves more than they feed others. Um, now that, that doesn't, I'm not trying to say that that is the case with rabbis. Um, I'm sure rabbis are very good people who are doing the best that they know how and the best that they can. Um, but as far as his way of choosing leaders to just say, oh, well, they're the ones who study the scriptures. They're the ones who know. So we'll just do what they say. That's what every cult says. Um, there has to be a better reason than what he is saying. From a Christian point of view, we take a look at the um, Gospel of John chapter 16 where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit coming and leading us into all things so and then you can also find some scriptures in the, in the New Testament that speaks about each person working out their own salvation in fear and trembling so there is um, the idea that we as individuals are responsible to seek out God on our own through the help of the Holy Spirit and to learn more about God. Um, but there's also some merit to, um, you know, having some teachers and um, people who have uh, researched to tell others but at the same time those leaders who are teaching you are subject to being in line with the apostles and the uh, prophets of the Tanakh so the most important thing is to line up with the Tanakh, the Tanakh and the apostles and on top of that then you are led by the Holy Spirit to learn those things and led by perhaps teachers that you will find in your life that will help you do that but it all must line up with what was done before and that's very simple so the leaders of the world um, forget the leaders of the world they're they're leading themselves and uh, I will see you next time. Shalom.